Church, you may be seated. Welcome to our study of the Gospel of John. I have fallen in love with the work of Paul as I've studied the book of 1 Corinthians, and I believe you will too. This is where Jesus taught in Capernaum, and you have to understand this scene. The Lord is my shepherd. And over the next six weeks, we're going to look deeply into the 23rd Psalm. Right now, media, it's for groups. It's for personal devotion. It's for parents. The bullseye of parenting is to raise children who become like Jesus. It's for kids. This is Phil. We're digging into the Bible, which, as we've mentioned, is more than just a book. It's for tough times. So when you recognize that you're trying to have a conversation with your spouse and they're not ready to talk, it's not helpful to keep pressing right. them. It's for every phase of life. If you've made mistakes with money, you know what that makes you? Over 12. <laughs> and now, it's yours. We've purchased a Right Now Media subscription for everyone in our church. Get equipped. Get inspired. Well, hey there, Ridge Church, Clinton. My name is Bobby, and I'm one of the pastors here. First of all, if today is your first day here at Ridge Church, Clinton, we are so glad that you're here. You literally could have been anywhere today, but you chose to be here, and we believe that it's not by accident that you're here, that God has a purpose and a reason for you being here today. So welcome. We're so glad that you're here. In fact, if you'll do us a quick favor, go ahead and take your cell phone out because we want you to send us a quick text message. In fact, if you'll just text the word welcome to the number that you see on the screen, 276-8107, we're going to send you a quick text message back. There's a link in that text message. Click the link, follow the instructions to put your name and your email address in that link, and that way you can communicate to us anytime you want. You can ask questions, Maybe there's something you want to know about the church, or maybe God leads you to a next step today, like baptism or joining a small group. This is a great way for you to let us know that. And we're going to send you some information about the church, too. Promise not to blow up your phone. So if you'll send the word welcome, text it to 276-8107. We're so glad that you're here today. And hey, if you're interested in being in a men's group or maybe some other groups, we have groups that meet. Uh, at Ridge Church Oak Ridge and all throughout the city. And so if that's something you're interested in, just send us a text to 276-8107. Ask us the questions that you need and we'll get that information over to you. Well, now we get to give together. We get to be generous because of God's generosity for us. And so we're gonna have somebody come on stage, walk you through that. But again, we're so glad that you're here worshiping with us Welcome if today is your first day, and so now let's all give together, let's be generous, let's be sacrificial, and let's do it with joyous, glad hearts. Sweet, right? Um, so the, the number uh, <coughs> 2768107 is going to be important in a lot that we do here, um, so if you have if you want information, uh, if you want to join Right Now Media, uh, if, you're, if you're new here, um, we encourage you to go ahead and send a text message of welcome to 276-8107. Uh, if you want to join Right Now Media, text the word join um, to 276-8107. Um, and uh, so that, that number is really important. So you may even want to just store it in there. That way you don't think it's spam. Um, anyways, um, at the time of giving. Uh, you can give online at uh, ridgegive.com. Um, don't feel obligated um, to give. Just, just don't feel obligated. Um, from your wallet, but give from your heart. Whatever God's calling you, um, it's it's not a it's not a it's not a number that that matters. 
um, as much as it is the heart of the giver. Um, we'll have ushers coming around, uh, so you can you can drop in the bucket. Also, um, there's a connect card in your seat. Um, if you want to fill that out, you can drop it in the offering bucket as well. Uh, or if you want, we can take those up at the end of the service too as you exit. Um, but church, let's go ahead and uh, as the ushers come around, we're going to go ahead and stand and continue to worship this morning. When my heart is under fire Another way when the walls are closing in And when I look at the space between Where I used to be and this reckoning I know I will never be alone There was another in the fire Standing next to me, there was another in the waters, holding back the sea. And should I ever need reminding of how I've been set free, there is a cross that bears the burden where another died for me. There is another in the fire. dead left for dead beneath the waters and I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore and should I fall in the space between what remains of me and this reckoning either way I won't bow to the things of this world and I know Come what may in the space between all the things I've seen and this reckoning, I know I will never be alone. Come on. And I know, I know I will never be alone. Be another in the fire.
Guys can go ahead and have your seat if you want to, and we're gonna pray. And we actually kind of have a dismissal for now. Three. I don't know. I don't know what. I don't know what to say, honestly. Um, all right, we didn't think we'd be saying three from here. We just found out things, but yeah. So, um, all right, I don't have to jump up. Um, in Romans chapter eight. Verse 11 through 13, it says, and this song just really was hitting me and making me think of it. Um, it says, and we have not been given, or no, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I had a verse off. It says, uh, in the same spirit who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then that, by that spirit, right, of Jesus, the one that raised Jesus from the grave, it'll bring our mortal bodies to life. And I know this isn't word for word, I'm just trying to read the main point right here. It says, uh, you know, by his own spirit. And then it goes on to say in the next verse, it says, so then, brothers and sisters, we have not received the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Instead, we've been given a spirit of adoption, so by whom we can cry out, Abba, Father. You know, when you think about that song, there's another in the fire, standing next to me. And think about this life we've lived, right? If we know Christ, if Christ is in us, there is nothing that this life can throw at us that we need to be afraid of. There's nothing too difficult. It means no matter what our scenario is or our circumstance, that if God is with us, even though it may be difficult in the season of life that we're in, there is a light coming in the darkness. There is a hope. And when we talk about like the series that we're in with Lost and Found, what I hope we come to terms with in the end of the series is uh, that we can cling to that light, cling to that hope. Like this spirit of adoption is true for every single one of us that will cling to Christ, right? That will submit our lives and surrender our lives to his will, to his authority, willingly that we would give our lives to Christ. And when we would do so, no matter what our stories have been up to this point, that we will see that it brings us all up to equal standing. Like circumstances of our life, past mistakes, past hurts, past anything, nothing defines us. He has defined us as his children, God's children, his children. We are not called into a relationship to fall back into fear or slavery, but one in which we can say he is my father, our daddy, our king, our sovereign Lord. And he knows you by name. That is the whole goal And when we talk about this, this lost and found. Regaining what was stolen from us when sin entered into the world. Like this unique sense of perfect communion with God the Father. And we get to, ex- we get to experience that, what it really looks like one day in heaven. Like here it's going to be limited. Like you notice in that line in the song it talks about how the, the, it, it got louder, the roar in heaven as the distance in between. You know what I mean? As we get nearer. Listen, one day we'll see him face to face. It won't be like this. It'll be even better. And this is still pretty solid. There'll be a day when it'll be perfect. So, anyways, it just was on my mind. We'll jump into it in just a second. And I'll recap what we talked about last week very briefly. But um, real quick, we are taking up goods, um, non-perishables. You saw them on the table outside probably. Anyways, this is, uh, we're going to actually partner. There's a church in Cookville that we got in contact with. And we're going to be able to deliver some goods there, but um, I think we're going to do that next week. And we're going to keep taking up some stuff because we're going to have more to go. Um, but what I really want to, like, like with that, it's about being there. Like, this is an hour away from us where, like, a tornado just wreaked havoc, right? And so this is, this is literally our family, like, in Tennessee, our family. So we're going to help them. Now, here's the weird part. I can't give you a day. Okay, so I can't tell you a timeline, but what I do know is we're going to go there and work. 
I don't know when because and I just talked to a dude yesterday for the first time on the phone ever. And in talking about it, they have, they're inundated. They're overwhelmed with, like, people trying to come and help right now, up to the point where they have, like, bracelets they could be able to get in to help because they can't do it. Like, we couldn't go if we wanted to and help, help. Um, but here's the reality, and this is just a sad reality, right? But it's, it is, it's, come on, there's some realities that are sad, and we just know it's true. In, like, three weeks, people are going to be like, oh, there's something else, so let's just completely forget about this, right? Nashville's going to get help because it's Nashville. It's big. It's, you know, it's popular. It's all this stuff. Cookville is not, I don't mean that in a bad way, it just means that they aren't going to stay in the spotlight. So what I've worked out with this guy that's uh, one of the pastors of this church is essentially this, he's going to let us know once there's a gap, and then we're going to jump in because whenever there's that gap, that's when we can step in to actually continue to help in a way that we can. It might mean that if you got a chainsaw, you might need a chainsaw. You got a shovel, shovel, like all these things, I don't know. I don't know what they'll need. They don't know what they need. Right now, they, they just want power. I can't do that. Not my thing. All right? But once they have power, then they'll know a little bit more. Once they get three weeks from now and people start to pull out, they'll know what the need is. So I know I'm asking you guys for a commitment here without being able to give you any kind of real details. But this is going to be at Oak Ridge and Clinton. It's an hour away, and we're going to make a drive. They have one shower. So if we do an overnighter, you have two options. <laughs> All right? Wait in line or be okay. Thou stinkest. Right? Um, I'm okay stinking. I have no problem with that. Um, I'll just spray on a whole lot of cologne. Axe body spray, I hear, is good. Um, okay, so that, and then um, we'll do this. We'll pray. We'll jump into it. If you guys remember me in prayer, um, um, also, is Allison Jones in here? Hey, Allison. I'll tell you my prayer request in a minute, but it is her birthday is the 4th, I believe it was, and Chris is going to sing her happy birthday, I think. Did you get my text? David, you should have gotten it. Can we sing, can you lead us off in happy birthday? Mike said, Michael said he, that this would really embarrass her, so, no, no, so can we sing happy, we don't get Allison up here every single Sunday because she's downstairs working with her kids, which we do need eight more volunteers. We had some step up last week. We need eight more, guys. I'm going to ask every week until we get this thing satisfied because this is not fair of us to expect just the same people to go all the time. And our kids deserve our best, and you are a part of that. So let's jump in the game. Huh? Oh, hold on. Oh, now we got to. Allison and Ashley's birthday. All right, we're going to sing happy birthday to everybody in March. <coughs> Caitlin's is yesterday. Gina's birthday. Okay, and we got some more next week. Hold up. I know, you're ter- 68, right? Yeah, uh, see? Huh? It should, uh, uh, that might put them on blast too much, but I'm for it. I'm all about it. All right, so I'm not a singer, but I'll lead us off. Can we sing happy birthday as a family? All right. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, everybody in March. Happy birthday to you. <coughs> hey. That was my audition for the worship team. I'm sure I'll get a contract soon. Um, if you guys remember me in prayer, um, so I'm wearing a hat. That might be weird, but it's not so weird to me. Um, in the fall, you guys remember, I did some uh, treatments for some precancer stuff. Basically, it's ginger lotion. And um, as a ginger, you got to put this stuff on because you don't want to get melanoma. Well, anyways, I have to go through another treatment. It just looks like I have herpes on my forehead, and I don't want to show that. Like, I don't put that on anybody else, so I'm wearing a hat. And also, I like wearing a cowboy hat, so it was a good excuse to break it out. And my wife's not here, so I didn't get in trouble. So many things I'm getting away with this morning. Also, I'm not going to walk around a whole lot. I do want you to pray for me on this. But the forehead thing is just means for like the next two weeks, it's going to be miserable for me, but I'll be fine. Um, I go tomorrow for an MRI on my knee. And then on Friday, I go to find out, like, how bad it is, basically. But um, I went to play basketball last Sunday, and Mike Jones undercut me so bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, I just I went up to the jump, and my body reminded me that I'm 40. And uh, my knee just gave out. It went the wrong direction. So anyways, I may have a torn ACL and a torn meniscus. I'll find out next uh, this week. Um, as weird as it is, been praying about it. Um, you know, one, I believe God can heal me. But if he doesn't, I also believe there's a lesson for me to learn in this. I have a hard time slowing down. And if you only have one leg, you kind of have to. So 
I have to do a little bit less around my house. I have to do a little bit less in just physical ways, and it's caused me mentally already to just slow down and just think things through. Like, what put on your brace before you walk from the bathroom or to the bedroom? Because last time I tried that, I just fell down on the floor. My son gets up out of bed. You okay? <laughs> Don't judge me, four-year-old. So pray for me. I'm not discouraged. I'm, I'm actually of good spirit. I feel good. Um, and I can stand and walk. I have a brace on. I just, it hurts after a while. And so I just want to start being wise with it. But if you guys would pray with me on that. Um, other than that, let's pray. And then let's just jump on in. So God, I thank you for who you are. That we can have fun in a church service and sing happy birthday and celebrate the life that you've given us. God, that we can I can get a Facebook message from a high schooler that says, hey, we want to help our family in Tennessee that got hit by these tornadoes. And it reminds me of how you are moving in the generations behind us. That I can look around at my family and I can see you moving in our lives, in my life. And God, I thank you for that. And I just ask that you would help us today to live for your glory, that you would speak to us through your word that you would remind us of your faithfulness and that you would continue to give us hope. That you would help me from saying anything that would take away or distract, that it would be God-honoring, that it would honor you, Father. But also that I would just be willing to share as your word has moved me openly and, and vulnerable. God, that you would open up our eyes, that we would see your truth, that if we are dead, Father, that you would give us life. God, that you would help us find what we've lost, and we would reclaim it through your name, through your son, that we would be found. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so last week, um, if you can remember, uh, the Cliff Note version of last week was, um, on your own, you are not able, right? We are powerless in our own uh, ways because of sin, and really... It goes into even more than just sin, but like there are life issues that we have that honestly, up to this point, we've been unsuccessful in actually overcoming them potentially. But listen, God has called us into a place of freedom, and he empowers us to overcome even the things that would kill us, that would eat us, that would like hurt us and wound us and cause us to continue to be in a, in a place of, of bondage, right? Bondage to our emotional state, to our physical state, but especially to our sin state. So, so we come to terms with the fact that we were powerless, but then we actually started to look at the fact that God is who he is. He is completely able and willing to help us in our bondage, in our powerlessness, to help us have hope in the midst of our hopelessness. Like he's, he is able and willing to take dead people and give us life. No matter what your deadness is, like we all suffer from spiritual deadness, but all of us have different bags of deadness too, right? Um, codependency, deep, deep deep-rooted wounds, hurt, someone else has hurt me, I've hurt someone else, like all of these things. And then we know that God is willing and able. Then the the last question we try to answer was, you know, what is it going to take? It's going to be us turning our will, our lives over to the care of a loving and good father that would help us. So this is what we got to last week. So this week, honestly, is it's going to be another toughie. And if I say anything that's probably a little bit too blunt, you guys are probably used to that now. Um, but we're going to take on a whole set of other stuff. So we're going to build on what we took last week. It's going to actually set us up for next week. But I would say out of this five-week series, this is, to me, I think one of the hardest. And I'm trying to cram a lot in, so I'm going to try to go really fast because I don't want to keep you here forever. And my tendency would be just to go into everything in detail. Um, because honestly, this should have been about a three-month study, but I'm doing it. We're going to do it in five weeks. All right. So that said, uh, the first thing I would start out with is you got to check yourself before you wreck yourself, right? And you may be like, "That's an, I think an NWA song, am I right?" Anybody? No one else is old enough, right? Just okay. I'm the only one with street cred, right? Um, you got to check yourself before you wreck yourself. And and really, what does that mean? In Lamentations 3:40, it says this. Let us examine and probe our ways and turn back to the Lord. And some translations will say, let us examine our ways and test them and let us return to the Lord. Here's what it means. Like we talked about God and his willingness and our powerlessness. Now it's time to actually 
get personal. So you'll hear me say from time to time, I'm going to meddle today. We're going to meddle. We're going to meddle. I'm going to meddle with your life, and you're going to meddle with my life. We're going to meddle today. What does that mean? None of you are perfect. None of us. Me neither, by the way. I am not perfect. I have flaws. I have issues. I have things in my life that I'm not even healthy enough to see it in my life yet. You ever had somebody point something out to you, and you're like, man, I could not have seen that, like the car in your blind spot, but it's really like a life thing? Like, well, you know, every time that, you know, something, you know, drama happens at work, you come home, and you're automatically in a bad mood, you're angry, and you don't even see the way that you're treating me. You ever had those conversations? You see, we have to take inventory of our lives. And this is what this verse in Lamentations is telling us. Let us to examine our ways, search out and examine our ways and turn back to the Lord. We have to actually be honest with ourselves. And the fact is, we lie to ourselves probably better than we lie to anyone else. Is that fair? I mean, when we talk about actually you know, examining, we have to start by being totally honest. We have to be honest really first with ourselves. Because if we can't even be honest with ourselves, we don't have to worry about starting to get better and recover and to grow and to start to find like wholeness or healing in our lives. <coughs> so I think you guys mostly know my story. Um, you know a lot of my story. I, I haven't shared every aspect of it. I think I probably shared more the first time I ever preached here, which was about a year ago, I guess, on a February. Um, I probably shared more then in kind of my, my deeper past, but... Um, I, I'll just shoot straight into it. And I am an addict, and I've been in recovery for about nine years now. Um, so in November, it'll be nine years of sobriety. It's praise God. I mean, honestly, that's a God thing. Um, it took me six months of going to a recovery program and to a 12 step group to figure out that I was an addict. Now, you would think, well, if you got to that point, you should have figured it out by now. But no, we lie to ourselves, right? So here I am in this recovery program. I'm going because I want to make sure that everybody else feels good about me. I mean, I just like to party a lot. You know what I mean? So that's my mindset. So anyways, here I am in this car. Like, I'm, I'm in this program, and here I am like, I guess, s probably about six months into a 12-step program. I mean, <laughs> I like it. Listen, you guys, you can roll with this. All right, so... I'm in this car outside of a dealer's house, right? And I'm sitting in this car, and I'm just sitting there. 45 minutes goes by, and I eventually ask the question, like, what am I doing? Why am I here? I mean, I, I had not used drugs or alcohol at that point up to then. And here I am in this driveway because our compulsive behaviors will kill you. I mean, listen, you may not be a, in addiction, and that's fine, but you have your own compulsive behaviors that are eating at you and killing you. Now, you may shut me out because I just said I was an addict, but that will be your loss, not mine. I'm fine. The fact is, none of us are perfect, and sin is sin. So we can look at each other's places of sin, and we can start to say, well, yours is worse than mine. That just makes you a hypocrite, and you just need to deal with it. Because the fact is, when we're talking about a perfect God, all it takes is even a moment, one sin spot, and it is infinitely against a divine and holy God. So there is no measurement of what sin is worse than another. Sin is sin, and you are ultimately unworthy, yet God in his grace, he has looked upon you and said, I love you and I choose you. So we can quit playing this game of discounting people because of their past. We can look at it and say, that's just their story, but God rewrites our stories all the time. So here I am in this driveway, and all I could think of is like, I am sick. I'm hurting. I'm here. And I wasn't drug sick. I was starting to now wake up to the fact that I get it. I'm an addict. So here I am. I, you know, I leave. I leave the driveway. Next sat the next Saturday comes. I go into my group. I'm just like, I'm ready, right? So here you are, twelve step group, bunch of guys. Like, anybody have any breakthroughs this week? I'm like, I just figured out this week that I am an addict. And, you know, so here I've been in this group for like six months, and then everybody in this group just starts clapping, like, slow, you know, golf clap, like, 
Welcome to the program, Wesley. We've all known that for like the last six months. And now that you're awake, you'll be able to start working the steps, right? So it was in this moment where I was finally totally honest with myself. I actually began to accept who I was, the good, the bad, the ugly, and allow God to like move in my life. Because up to this point, it was all pride-based. But now in this place with me surrendering and being honest with myself, I can actually see God moving in my life in a way that actually is significant and matters. You see, we've got to be totally honest with ourselves. There are things in your life that you have avoided up to this point. You see, denial is a survival skill. Most of us have put this into our lives for years and years and years, right? We deny it with grief. We deny it with anxieties. We deny it with addictions. We deny it with, well, I'll never let anyone else hurt me again. So you can control what everyone else will ever do in the rest of your life. You're telling me that you have that kind of control. No, this is just something you've convinced yourself of. I've convinced myself of so that I'll be okay. I feel like I, this sense of control is going to help me. But the problem with that is... It's a survival skill, but it's not a thriving skill. Listen, people will hurt you because people suck sometimes. Right? I did. I know. I'm, there are still days I'm just like, my wife will say something, and I know I should probably respond with a kind word instead of something snarky. Right? But the, the fact is, hurt people hurt people. My daughter was at school this week. She came in. She had a bad day. She finally got it out of her, but she said, I had a bad day. And she was just a little turd, honestly, like, like to me. So this is what I was, I was like, ah, what is going on with you? So eventually, you, you know, you ask the right question the right way enough times, especially with a six-year-old little girl. And eventually she said, I had a bad day, Dad. Well, what made you have a bad day? Max said I wasn't pretty. I said, well, Max is an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> I said, is that the kid with the bowl cut that has a weird face? She's like, yeah. And then I said, I said, baby, listen. I said, here's what you really need to know. I said, I'm just trying to make you laugh, but the fact is, is Max, we don't know what goes on in his home. And I've hardly ever seen someone that's in a healthy place relationship-wise, life-wise, just intentionally try to hurt someone. But you know who does hurt people? Hurt people. I don't know what his mom and dad are like. I don't know what he gets at home. I don't know what his, his I don't know anything about this kid. I said, and baby, first off, what he has to say to you will never define you. God has defined you. Amen. But whatever Max may say to you or anyone else in your life, just know this, that if they try to hurt you, you don't have to let them. Remember your identity is in Christ. And when someone wants to come at you like this, we fight back with kindness compassion and forgiveness because that is what God has called us to and then if all else fails I'll come to school and I'll get banned <laughs> we have to be totally honest with ourselves about everything so this is where we're taking this inventory we're looking at our lives Jeremiah says this in 17 9 through 10 it says the heart is more deceitful than anything else and incurable who can understand it I, the Lord, examine the mind, I test the heart, and to give to each according to his way, according to what his actions deserve. So we have to understand that when we investigate our lives, we can't necessarily trust our hearts. All right, let's just be real. I'm not going to tell you to trust your gut. I said it last week, that's dumb, right? Because if you just trust your gut, to be honest, anybody here, anybody here been led to a poor decision based on a heart feeling? Right? Like all of us, right? I mean, unless you're under the age of like eight, it's all candy-based at that point. Even when it comes down to investigating your own life, like this isn't even about decisions. We're not even at decision stage. We're only at looking and searching our ways, right? Like searching in our heart. God, what's going on? Why do I feel hurt? Why do I feel mad? Why do I feel sad? Why do I struggle with this? Why do I want to go do this? Why do I feel obsessive about this? Why am I compulsive about this? Why has this person had this kind of leverage over my life for so long? We're looking into our life. We're not going to let emotion be the steering, guiding compass of our lives at this point. We're just trying to identify. So there may even be moments where whatever it is, you ever been hurt but don't know why? 
Like, I just, I don't know why I feel so weird about that. That's an okay spot, like place to start. Okay? We need to start to identify these places where our, our lives have baggage. As we have clarity, we need to identify causes. And some of those things are going to take working together. Case in point, have you ever had a moment where you're talking about a hurt and then you've had a friend say, you think it's because of this? And then you really pause and think about it and you're like, that, I've never thought about it like that, but that makes so much more sense. than I, got, I couldn't place my, my finger on it, but now I'm starting to understand. We have to seek wisdom, right? And there's no one that we can get better guidance and wisdom th- from than God himself, and that's going to involve prayer and seeking his word through scripture, but also working together as a faith family to help each other in life. We aren't designed to go through grief together or, or alone. We're designed to go through it together. We are not designed to go through life hurts alone. We are designed to go through that together. This is our obligation as a faith family to one another, is to love one another as imperfectly as it may be, but consistently. Because we aren't going to get it perfect every time, but we're going to try to give it the best that we can every time. But we're going to submit it to the scripture to see how to do so the right way. So scripture will guide us. And here's the thing, you know, we think about denial as a survival skill and, it, and it, we use it to protect us. So, like, it's way easier to deny that you have a problem, a hurt, a weakness, a habit, a compulsive behavior, the fact that someone has leverage over you or emotional control over you. Like, we want to convince ourselves that it's all okay. You ever try to tell yourself it's just all okay? What if it ain't? What do you do then? It's going to be okay, God. I don't know if it is. It may be crazy as I'll get out next week. But God is faithful. And if it's not okay, guess what? We have another in the fire. Think about that. What if it's not going to be okay? What if, what if it isn't? It's okay to not be okay. But we aren't going to stay there. We're going to move forward. Listen to this in Galatians. In Galatians 3, or 6, Galatians 6, verse 3 through 5, it says, For if anyone considers himself something, then when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Let each person examine his own work. Then he can take pride in himself alone and not compare himself with someone else. For each person will have to carry his own load. You see, as much as we want to deny, and as much as we want to convince ourselves that it's okay, I'm good. I mean, I'm all right. Listen, we need each other, we need Christ, and we all have our bags. It's time for us to start owning that and to point to them and actually let go of the baggage that has held us into this place where we are into a place of pain, doubt, lack of confidence, like any of this stuff like that it is robbing us for. Like when we talk about our baggage, when I said this in Romans about he did not give us a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, your bags are your slave owner. Do you understand that? He did not give you a spirit of slavery to fall back into the fear, the fear of loss of control, the fear of what happens if I can't do all the things that my friends do, or what happens if I never find that loved one, like what if, what if I never find someone to get married to, what if God's called you into singleness and that isn't the goal? It doesn't mean that we have to sleep our way until we figure out who it is. Like, what if God has just called us to lean on him, to let go of these bags? Because he has. He has called us to a spirit of adoption, right? His children. We cling to that. We cling to him. And we see our things that are hurting us, whatever they may be, good, bad, ugly, and we just identify them. Like, I'm not even asking you to, like, tell me all your dirty little secrets. I'm just telling you to point at them for yourselves. Look at it. And notice it. Recognize it. I struggle with porn. I struggle with prostitution. I don't know. I struggle with overeating. I struggle with... I struggle with 
Fill in your blank. I'm just throwing out some stuff, but fill in your blank. We all have blanks. And if you've convinced yourself that you don't have blanks, let me remind you of what it says here. If anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. You're not deceiving me. You're deceiving yourself, and you're the one rejecting life and holding on to a spirit of slavery. This is a process. This is going to last a long time. <clears throat> what do we do after that? So we've taken this inventory. We started to identify these things, but now we actually take a next step. And this is when we actually have to take this step. So we identify our baggage, and we're going really fast toward this because like most of us may have avoided this thing for the last 30 years, but now all of a sudden I'm starting to have this emotional feeling because now I'm pointing at the thing that has ate my lunch every day for the last 30 years. Now I'm going to ask you to take a step and admit that. To God first, to own it, to give it to God, to say, God, hey, listen, I struggle with this and I don't even know what to do with it, but I want you to know that I struggle with this blank. And then I would ask you to hand that over to the Father. <clears throat> and then I'd ask you to look around. Not because we're trying to see who's talking weirdly and hand this stuff over to the Father, but I'd ask you to look around because next I would ask you to find someone that you can trust in this faith family that you can confess and admit to. And you're like, well, that's awful. That's a big step there, Wesley. It is. But freedom is worth every single sacrifice. Listen to this. In James 5.16, it says, mm -mm. let me find it. Yeah, I got it right here. James 5.16, Therefore confess your sins to one another and to pray for one another so that you may be healed. Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed and my translation, it says, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The, power, uh, the prayer of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. Why am I asking you to confess to God and then to confess to each other? Because I want you to actually have wholeness. I don't just want us to be a bunch of gossips that know all of our dirty little secrets. That's not effective. Like, I share my life very personally with the men in my small group. They know what I struggle with. They know when I mess up. They know my successes, my failures. We live our lives in a way that we help encourage each other because, honestly, we want for each other to be whole. And the only way that we know to do that, right, isn't through um, Dr. Phil or Oprah or anyone else. It is through one. It is through what the Scripture says. We surrender our lives and submit it to Scripture. And if the Bible says, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you can be healed, I believe that's true. Like, this isn't me trying to just ruin your Sunday. This is me telling you, if the Bible says it, I believe it. Do you want wholeness? Do you want to be healed? Do you want to see what God has in store for you? Then let's be faithful to what He's called you to. He's called you to live a life transparently with is people. And I don't need to know who you talk to about it. If it's not me, you don't have to tell me squat. That's honestly make my day a whole lot easier probably. But you gotta have somebody. You gotta have somebody. Listen, he called the church to deep relationships and this is part of it. And here's what you get to avoid. You see, guilt, guilt does some things, right? Guilt destroys your confidence it destroys your relationships, and it keeps you stuck in the past. And if you don't believe me, just think about this. You ever been in a relationship just waiting for the other shoe to drop, like waiting for them to either figure out who you are really or to find out about this or that? And you just know it's going to happen, so every time you get ready to see them and they say, hey, we need to talk, your first initial instinct is, oh, God, they know. Anybody? Or am I just like the only bad boyfriend that's ever been in this room? Like, I'm not a boyfriend anymore, but... I mean, there are times where it's like, oh, this is going to be a bad conversation, right? Am I the only one that's ever lived that with? No? All right, good. Y'all are scandalous. Um, it, eventually, it destroys your relationships, not even just like, you know, affectionate type. You see, guilt will kill your relationship at work. It'll kill your relationship with your family. It'll kill your relationship with your friends. It'll kill your relationship with God even, right? Because... Don't you always have this place where guilt leads you back to this? Can God really love me if? Can God love an addict? 
Can God love me if I've had an affair? Can God love me if I've I struggle with porn? Can God love me if I can God love me if I can God love me if I I, I can't even love me. How can God love me? You see, guilt destroys our relationships and it keeps us stuck in the past. Until we start to identify these, it'll hold us back. You can't move past it. I used to hate my dad for so long, for the majority of my life. And by the grace of God, there was a moment right before he passed away that he brought me to be in front of my dad. I really went, I wanted to just punch him right in the face because I really hated my dad. And I saw my dad for the last time and I saw his physical form like he was dying right in front of me. And I come, I see him, he's living in a little RV, but I mean like, it's not, it's a generous term to call an RV. It's really about the size of like these two rows in the front. It's filled with squall. I mean, just, it was, it was awful. I don't know how a person can live like that. And he chose that life. So me and a friend of mine went and I immediately began fixing things in his house just to try to help out. Like it, God used a moment seeing my dad where he was to say, Wesley, you aren't the one that missed out the most. Like, I absolutely missed out. I think every kid should grow up with a dad engaged in their lives. It's just, it's right. But when I saw my dad, I, re- I realized that he missed out on it more than I did. He had a daughter, a son, and a, a wife that wanted to love him. Can you imagine? What, what does it feel like when you're 50 years old on your deathbed and your reflection back is, is that I had it all, but I chose none of it? Like, I didn't have a choice. I can at least look at that and say, yeah, I mean, if I had a choice, then that's one thing. But I didn't. He did. I don't know. To me, I feel like that would be way worse than anything I ever experienced as a son without a father. Now, the work of confession. Oh, the reason I say that is because, honestly, I was stuck in that mode of hate until that moment that I confronted it. And when I confronted it, God used that to free me from this, the being stuck into this I'm unlovable, my dad hates me, I just want to, I want to kill my dad. Like, I didn't have these feelings anymore when I left. Instead, I left that situation and I was like, I forgive you. And I've never, I, I'm telling you, I've never felt more free in a moment. God used that for me. This is our work of confession. So we're going to share with each other. You guys understand that? Like, I want you to follow up with this. This whole, this whole series, I don't want this to be a series where you came and you did your church thing for the week and then the rest of the week you don't think about this. I want this to change your life. I want you to put this into place today. Identify bags and find someone, like share it with God and find someone to share it with. And if you don't know who to go to, fill out a connect card. We'll find someone. It, we can make it confidential if you're like, oh, there's no way I can share that with anybody. This is to be a safe place. 1 John 1, 8, 9 says, if we, you know, yet again, if we say, well, that's not me because I'm a church person and, you know, I'm not as bad as Wesley, that's cool. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, okay, you're perfect. And that ain't you. But it also means that the truth does not live in you. Because the reality is, is you're human. And every single one of us have stuff. Every single one of us have things in our lives that we can set aside. And here's the beauty of it. Anybody have a deep, dark secret and they want to just share it? Right? Nobody, right? But here's the reality. Whatever you got to share, God is not going to be blindsided. He knows you. He already knows what you've done. And he knew it before he created you. Yet he still created you and he still loves you. He didn't make a mistake. What you've got to share with God will not surprise him. Now, you might blow somebody else's socks off, and that's cool. It's actually kind of funny. But you don't have to worry about it because this is a safe place, and God loves you. And God's love is all that matters. And he has called us as the church to reproduce that love, to be that love to each other. So, listen, we are each other's family and safety. I've got to really speed up, and I'm sorry. So I'm going to go fast for a minute. We are only as sick as our secrets. So if you don't want to share this, just know that you will not get better. You will always be as sick as whatever you want to hold on to. And God has called us to be healed. Where do these issues come from? Honestly, a bunch of different factors. Biological, sociological, theological. But here's the beauty. In James 4.10, it says to humble yourselves before the Lord because he will lift you up. 
You see, if we will just humble ourselves before Christ, he will pick us up. But a proud heart doesn't confess sin. A humble heart does. A humble heart is willing to accept that someone has hurt you. Yes, I've been hurt, and because of that hurt, it has imprisoned me. Yeah, I've been hurt. I've, I've lost loved ones, and I honestly, I just can't forgive the driver of that car. I can't forgive the guy that hit me. I can't forgive the girl that cheated on me. I can't forgive, like, you know what? You have to. The humble heart realizes that none of us are perfect and we're willing to let it go and let God. And when we actually surrender our lives and we humbly approach the throne of God, he picks us up, he carries us, and he is always with us. You see, we prepare for this step by quieting our minds and opening our hearts, and we understand that healing requires God and not self-will. You can will yourself all day long, but it will not fix it. Remember, denial is a control mechanism that we use to try to protect ourselves, yet it always leaves us in a wounded place. It never resolves the issue. Yet God says, if you humble yourself before me, I will exalt you. I will pick you up. If you confess your sin, you will be healed. I've given you a people to do this with so we can all be imperfect together and we can just be hot messes until potluck Sunday and the food is going to be great and we're going to come around our hot messiness and we're going to eat some fried chicken and it's going to be fantastic. And we're going to have war stories that we can share and talk about. You remember that time that you helped me through this? I'll never forget that friendship. You see, that is the church on so many levels to do life with. Good, the bad, the ugly, the things that you may think that you can never tell another soul. God has not given us a spirit of neglect either. He has given us a spirit of adoption. And that means if we're adopted, we're brothers and sisters. We are family. We get to do it together. In 1 Peter 1, 13 through 14, it says, Therefore, we talk about really thinking and humbling ourselves before the Lord. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given when Christ is revealed. There is just an aspect of this that we need to be okay with. That even if we confess it today, it doesn't mean that there will be moments where this hurt rears its head back up. There are moments when just life's hard and it reminds you of things in the past and it still hurts, right? It's okay. That's why we have a family. Because when we hurt, what do we do? We reach out. We reach up. You see, God is preparing us. He is moving at us. But we also have to set our minds toward him. And in some ways, we have to understand it says be self-controlled. So here's the thing. Um, if you know you have an issue... Being self-controlled means putting things in place to protect you from being a moron. That's a, hey, listen, we're all morons. I am probably the biggest moron in here at times. So what do I try to do? I try to set things in place that keep me from doing moron things. Right? Case in point. Um, I did not wait to get married before, you know, stuff. And I don't mean that in a weird way. I'm telling you this because... There are some biological aspects that studies have shown that, you know, like, uh, like adultery, for example, faithfulness, right? There is studies that are shown that if a father is unfaithful, then the male son actually will tend to have tendencies to want to be unfaithful. It's a psychological, like, sociological study. This is no joke. So my dad was not faithful. I, I think I had a half-brother at one point named Scooter, but then we found out he wasn't my, my dad's son whole mess, and yes, his name was literally Scooter. I babysat him. This is how sick and twisted this is, right? I babysat him when he was a baby because my dad was like, hey, I need you to do this, son. It's like, oh, okay, not me. Just starving for my dad's affection. I was like, all right, I'll babysit my half-brother. Cool. I know nothing about kids. Why not? This is really safe. Um, my dad was always in some type of affair, right? So what do I do? I have to I put things in place like you ain't gonna see me going on a date with some girl right 
obvious, right? That's a big one. But very rarely do I have meetings here individually with just ladies. And if you ever see one, more than likely you'll notice that it's in the office downstairs with the door open. And if it's something that has to be confidential, guess what's on the door? There's a window. Hard to get, you know, I, I'm not going to go too far in, but you know what I'm saying. I put these things in place because, honestly, I know me well enough to know that I don't trust me. And I don't. I mean, why? Because I'm my dad's son. So I'm going to put things in place to keep me from being a moron. What does it also mean? I don't hang out with drug dealers. Obvious reasons, right? Does this make sense? Anybody with me or anybody like, hey, man, this guy really is. How does he a pastor? <laughs> it's okay because I ask the same question every single Sunday. How am I a pastor? Because God can use a donkey to carry a great message. All right? So we need to be self-controlled. We need to put things in place. There are healthy boundaries. You'll hear me talk about boundaries. There are moments where we need to have relational boundaries with other people because you know what? If you are tired of being hurt by so on, you know, so-and-so, guess what? One, don't date that loser. That's a bad idea. But two, let's say you can't help it. For me, one of the moments in recovery, and I'll share this, and then I'll hustle because I know we're at time. The thing that really was my catalyst for my recovery was the day that um, I had relapsed and I called my sister to talk to her about it. And my sister said, Wesley, I love you. I love you and I'll never not love you. But you can't be around my kids until you figure this out. And I knew in that moment that I would never see my nieces or my nephews unless I, there's something that changes within me. Now you may, you know, we can look at this and say, well, that's a jerk move. Right when you needed someone to love you and to be there for you, and you're right, my sister is such a jerk. Um, but no, the reality is this, is that that's the most loving thing she's ever done for me. She set something in stone that said basically, I love you, and I want you in my life, and I want you in my kids' lives. But I can't continue to see you hurt them and they love you. They love their Uncle Wesley. I'm the fun uncle. And you guys knew that already, right? I guess he would be a fun uncle. Um, that was the moment that I woke up. That was the moment that I started my journey to actually recover. And it took someone loving me in a way that was very stern, self-controlled. You see, being self-controlled is critical. Because God is with us. But listen... You and I are sometimes our biggest stumbling blocks. So be self-controlled. And there is a difference between recognizing the need for change and being willing to change. We can call a spade a spade all day, but it doesn't mean you're playing cards. The question is, is are you going to get in the game and start to live your life in a way to surrender your life, being willing to see whatever God will do with it that he would do with it? Are you willing to do what it would take? Are you willing to give up what it would take? Are you willing to surrender what it would take? Philippians 3, 12 through 14 says, Not that I've already obtained this or already been made perfect, but I press on. I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took off of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to take hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward a goal to win the prize for what God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Here is our set of next steps, guys. We have identified our sin, and if you haven't yet, that's fine because it's been like 45 minutes maybe, but work on this this week. Identify your places of pain, of sin, of, of bondage, Confess this sin to God, and then with each other, find an accountability partner to confess with, someone that you can trust, that you can just be honest with. And if you don't have that, listen, that is okay. If you're willing, we will find you someone that you can be accountable. Or, good Lord, what was that? I just had a stroke. Accountable. Accountable with, okay? We will find you someone. Listen. I promise you that. We will find someone that I would put my trust in. I give you my word. Don't do this alone. You can't do it alone. You will fail. 
doing this alone. And God never called you to. He gave you a family because of his deep love for you. Please do this. Like, I, I, I'm telling you, this isn't a series because I just want to get into people's business. This is a series because I actually love you. And God has called you to wholeness. God actually loves you. Every single one of us, he loves you. And he wants more for you than what we've said for up to this point. Will you allow him control of your life? And will you open up with honesty and humility and allow yourself to be loved by us? Will you look at your stuff? Will you identify it? Will you admit it? Will you take the time to reflect on what God is doing and what God has done and what he will do? And would you repent and follow what God has called you to? He's called you to wholeness, not slavery. He's called you to life, not death. He's called you to hope, not hopelessness. And he has called you to love, not despair. That is who he is. That is what he is doing. The question is, is what will you do with it? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for who you are, for your love, mercy, and grace. God, thank you for the fact that you can use all of us, me included, with weird stories and normal stories and stories we are yet to accept our hours. But God, you are in the business of giving dead people life, and here we are, a room full of dead people apart from you, yet you in your glory and in your grace have decided to step into our lives and offer us life. And God, please speak life into us that we would find you and love you and hold you and we would live through you and that our lives would be redefined and rewritten by your spirit. So, God, we thank you, and we ask this all, Father, in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Church, let's stand together as we continue in worship.
Church, it's been awesome uh, worshiping with you this morning, both through song and through message. Um, so grateful uh, to be able to share this day with y'all and, and these moments. Um, like Wesley said, if, if you've not identified that problem, uh, what what your struggle is, I struggle with. Um, that's that's okay. But if you know there's a struggle and you need to talk to somebody, come talk to one of us. Put it on a connection card. We'll connect you with someone um, who you can talk to. It. We'll keep it confidential. We're not going to go and split everything on Facebook. Um, that's just not how we operate. Uh, that's not how God operates. Um, but God also wants us to, to work together. Um, he wants us to talk to him, but he also wants us to speak to one another and work through these struggles together, um, to, do, to do life together. Um, and uh, so if, if there is something, please, um, please come, come and talk to somebody. Um, church, let's, let's go ahead and pray, and we'll be dismissed this morning. Dear precious Heavenly Father God, we thank you so much for being with us in the fire and for holding back the seas, God, and to help us through through the tough times, God, and but also you're there through the good times as well, Father. And Father, the struggles that we deal with, we were never made to deal with them alone. And Father, I, I, I pray for those that, that are struggling, God. Um, we all struggle with something. Father, if the problem's not been identified, you know, God, I, I know that you'll reveal it. Um, but God, please, um, please give us the courage to go and talk to someone about the struggle. That way we can work through this together, God. And, and Father, we, we thank you so much um, for this opportunity to come and worship you today, God, and to praise your name, both through song and through the message that you gave Wesley this morning, Father. Father, I pray that you will you will take everyone home safely and bring them back next week, Father. And it is in your son's name we pray, the precious name of Jesus. Amen. You're dismissed. We'll see you all next week.